side of the pond. He is DJ Schweitzer. I am Jeremy Lance. It is still election night. We actually we tried to avoid not recording during election night, but this thing won't end. So here we are on, on election night part two, uh, trying to do a podcast. Yeah, um, still don't have a president elect named for 2020, uh, and yet we elect to interrupt all of this election coverage with basically inane, non-important things that really don't matter about anything that's going on in any people's real lives outside of, you know, like the millions of people that invest themselves in this each morning and actually get paid by, you know, the people have jobs. Those are all real things too, but it feels, it just feels so inconsequential sometimes as I like tried to focus on soccer things over the last 48 hours, it just it yeah. felt it, it sometimes felt like oh, I'm just trying to put off something that's actually the more important thing in the background. And soccer's felt like this distraction in so many points of my life. But I don't know. It's just it's for the last 40 hours or so. It just has felt very unimportant in the grand scheme of things in a way that it's never really felt before. Um, I, I'm actually looking at a list of, uh, former footballers turned politicians. It's a long list, probably. It's, it's, it's more than you think it would be. Um, it, you know, they kind of, a lot of them get vaulted into politics for one reason or another. Um, did you know that Sol Campbell, uh, uh, r- attempted to run for mayor of London. I would imagine that it went very poorly given how most of his managerial opportunities have gone. Uh, you, you would be uh, correct. Uh, that, that is, that is very true. That is, that is exactly what happened. Uh, it did not go well at all. Um, d- did you know, uh, uh, Arshavid, the, the kid from, uh, remember the kid from, from, Arsenal that was supposed to be like amazing and then he he wasn't. Um he he actually got involved in Russian politics, uh, which is oh always a safe thing to do. Yeah, I mean I can I mean, getting involved in Russian politics is basically just like throwing yourself into a game of real life Russian roulette. Like in, you may end up on a side where you actually get to die for the wrong perhaps inane decision. Uh, there are loads of Brazilians who have actually gotten involved with it. Like uh, Romario, the great forward for Brazil uh, has been a Brazilian congressman, I think now for like going on 10 years. Um, a, a lot of other Brazilian <clears throat> greats have actually gotten involved in the game. It's easy to kind of like parlay that popularism that comes from that nationalist kind of aspect of you know, playing for your national team into a career in politics. And yeah, it's, it's not surprising that we've seen similar kind of things happen here frequently. Uh, Tommy Tuberville, uh, for, former University of Cincinnati head coach uh, in the realm among of... Other, uh, among other stops. Yeah, uh, he, he did other things. Um, uh, most famous here in Cincinnati for being bewildered by the fact that uh, the startup minor league soccer team was outdrawing uh, his division one football team in their own house. Um, but it just kind of, it shows you like someone like Tommy Tuberville, who's clearly kind of inept at a lot of things um, that he can get elected in his home state, almost exclusively uh, off of the back of his sports involvement. And that's just, um, it's one of those things that even as politics overshadows things like sports and, and makes sports things seem so unimportant uh, that it, it can still uh, – the reach of sports is still so pervasive in a way that it, it allows people that have absolutely probably no business at all governing us uh, the opportunity to do so. So I, I was just distracted that I pulled up this picture of uh, Romario um, – as a politician having dinner with uh, Spike Lee. Why not? Because why? Because why wouldn't you do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, I, 
it, it is a weird thing that so many uh, really athletes and, and sports people of any kind always think they can like then get into politics. Like I, you would think, and obviously we have some very clear examples of why that's where that's not the case uh, where like you would, you know, kind of think that you would be more electable if you kind of like seem to have a back, Background in all of the issues or some of the issues that you would have to be taking care of as a politician, as a leader, as an elected official that has to pass laws, create, you know, social programs, plans, budgets, whatever. Uh, you would think you'd have to have some sort of background in, in some of those things. Mm, maybe, but and not hey. just be that guy we really like cheering for nepotism you know the the game of, of of who you know is pervasive not just in the world of football but also also politics and uh obviously uh, when you get elevated to the status of important professional athlete that opens a few more connection points for you to to potentially lean into so luckily no one in american soccer is getting voted in to take over anything in american politics sounds like it might be a good idea on the surface, but you just get the feeling that literally no one within the ranks like has enough wherewithal uh, to, to really take on the reins of that type of responsibility. Speaking of reins of responsibility, we all take on the reins of fantasy soccer, and, and some of us are not very responsible. Uh, those people who are not responsible involve you and I. Uh, we both fell this week. I fell five places to 43rd. You fell seven places to 60th. Uh, so we're not doing well. Uh, still at the top of the table, Zach Ferguson's first do FC, second show in a row. Over to the MLS side of things, uh, not entirely better. I am hold on. Hold on. What, what, what was that name? First, first do FC? I don't even know what that means. Are we supposed to? I don't know. I feel like is it like an? I feel like some people just make these names. They're like an inside joke for just them. It's like you're in a league with like a hundred other people. <laughs> no one knows what your stupid name is. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I've got a great pun that only I or two other people might get, and that's just not the way I need to go about. And, yeah, I feel like I need to Google search this stuff. And hey, any way that we can cut down the winner here, I'm down for uh, as well. <laughs> Uh, MLS side, I improved two places to 29th. You improved zero places to 38th. Uh, Marines fill six straight shows on the top. There's your fantasy update. Let's get into the real soccer because, and I think the, the marquee match of the weekend is just kind of one of those ones. It's almost <clears throat> the microcosm of the Premier League season right now. Like, pandemic, it's shortened things. It's made things a little bit more unpredictable to a certain extent. And oh, yeah. I think Manchester United and Arsenal, not just the outcome, but the game itself felt unpredictable most of the way across. I also sense like we're kind of just everything is just weird and we're jamming things together. Like. I feel like we've had a few. Marquee matches so far this season. Mm -hmm. and, like I feel like maybe outside of the Merseyside Derby, like most of them aren't getting like hyped up. Like, Man U Arsenal is normally one that's supposed to get, like, super hyped up. Right. It's a classic EPL rivalry. I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that going on. No. I don't feel like there was, like, just not, no one, like, it, it slipped people's mind, like, oh, yeah, we should really care about this. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure the kickoff time helped things to begin with, but I think it, it's a little bit of a testament to how far these two teams have fallen, uh, at least in terms of their influence and their expectations, not just from those of us who who support those two teams, but also the teams that are already participating in those sp spaces. And I don't know, there just there doesn't seem to be enough pressure anywhere to really get uh, at least the United side of the equation. And, and maybe we can divert off here and, and give some praise to Arsenal as well. But just to stay on the the old eyes side of things. He just can't seem to inspire them to consistently put out what we know they're capable of. Yeah, it's, you know, I feel like once again, 
we are finding uh, ourselves putting Ole under the microscope and, and kind of putting him on the hot seat a bit. I feel like we've done this several times now in his Man United uh, managerial tenure. And yet, all this means, according to all the other times, is that like next week or in a week or two, they're going to have some real big performances. Because yeah. they always, he, his side always <laughs> ends up doing just enough in the end to where like he salvages it at the last moment, like all the time. And, and I think we're on the cusp of that, where we're seeing some bad performances. We're not going to get into it much, but like they lose in in uh, in Champions League mm-hmm. to a team that's like uh, not even like like is basically the, it's the same age as like an MLS club, uh, <laughs> losing to one of them uh, from from Istanbul in the Champions League. De- and Baba, who's like 40 years old, scored against them. Of course uh, he would. And then, and then you, you talk about this game. Uh, Manchester United losing to Arsenal. And I, I saw a lot of people really call out the way that Ole set his team up to go about this match where he was trying to play this diamond to kind of force Arsenal out wide. When like Arsenal wanted to be out wide anyways. It just it he he seems like a guy who played enough that he thinks he knows what's happening, but actually doesn't know how to truly counteract an effective strategy or one that, that might be worth exploiting. He just he seems he seems like a clown. And it, it's sad that we've reached this point already with him, but it it, you can't feel like this is the right answer either, right? No. I mean, I feel like he is... It's almost as if he's like the Bruce Arena Band-Aid, right? Remember for the U.S. Men's National Team, it was this like, hey, well, we'll just get, you know, we'll just get Bruce in here, and he'll, we'll ride this out a little, little bit, and then, you know, obviously we'll get to a point, you know, we'll get to that place where we need to be, and then we'll make that real change. And, like, that's... And much like it did in that case, uh, it didn't work. Well, I mean, it depends on on what angle you want to look at it from. But no, it's just it's 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 tough. Um, it's you don't want to undermine it. I, I saw a great comparison that showed a uh, hundred games of Ole in charge of Man United and a hundred games of Klopp in charge of Liverpool, and the numbers were strikingly similar. Right, like. To the to the point that it, it almost caught me off guard. Like I I assumed when I clicked on that link that that Ole would have a much worse record along that time frame, and, and that's not true. Like it it just it really depends on the angle that everyone wants to look at it from. But it's like one. But the, I would say the difference there is when Klopp came to Liverpool, it was pretty clear from the get what his plan was for that club, how he wanted to change it, what he wanted to change it into, and how he saw that leading to their success. Where with Ole, I don't think we have any of that. And it's honestly not even almost entirely his fault because you also have uh, the guy ahead of him in, in Ed Woodward who also seems to be not really laying out some big plan and some big... Um, scheme of like how they're going to rebuild this club and how they're going to make them successful. Oh, for sure. No, it's, it's definitely that way. Manchester United find themselves in 15th place. They do have a game in hand, but let's, even if we give them that game in hand, that only means they're in like 12th or 13th. So like the game in hand thing really means very little at the moment because either way they're on the back half of the table. This is, I mean, this is not an acceptable, and I know it's early in the season, right? Like we're 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 barely in, but this is an unacceptable place in the table for Manchester United to be. And I just I don't understand how a club that's just continued to throw money at their issues hasn't yet truly rooted out the person that's responsible for all this. It's not it's not you. It's not what I do. It's 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 the people behind the scenes that are just continuously making this a a worse scenario for everyone involved. If 
I what if I were to give you uh you know some betting odds or whatever on Pochettino being Manchester United's manager. I don't want. I don't want to answer this. I don't want to answer. I'll give it. you two to one by the end of the season. Match day, what uh, uh thirty-eight or whatever. Uh, um, that they that it's Pochettino in charge. No one can uh, see what I'm doing right no. now, but I'm just vigorously shaking my head at the camera. I just, I really, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It's the most obvious answer. I just, if they were going to do it, why haven't they done it by now? Like, how much how much more evidence do you need out of Ole to be like, look, look what Spurs achieved with what they spent with that guy. What? Why can't we spend, like, a hundred times more than that and not get better results than what we're currently doing? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and I think you're also seeing a situation where, and I think it's been building for some time. It's, it's odd to think about Manchester United of what they really have been. I mean, you look at the, we're, we are kind of, we have ended a decade, but, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson's last match as manager of Manchester United was in what, like May of 2013. Uh, 13. Sure, I believe. Um, have have they been a force to be reckoned with since then? Have they been mm-hmm. the Manchester United of of the two thousands and uh, uh before since then? I mean, the easy answer is oh. no, right? <laughs> like, they're very clearly not. If if you started watching soccer ten years ago. Manchester United were still that team, right? Like this this team up on a pinnacle that no one else could come close to. Meanwhile, uh, you know, over the last you know four or five seasons, we've seen them get knocked out in the Champions League in increasingly earlier stages, uh, and and their their bookshelves remain packed in a way that it's not the teacher's fault. Like they're do, they're doing everything they can to encourage these kids, but and, and they are, you know, they're on the. Since Sir Alex left uh, the touchline in 2013, they're on their fourth permanent manager since yeah. then. And he's already looking like he might be heading out the door here soon. Well, like, I mean, is that entirely surprising? Just right there. We're getting close. I mean, it's not, it's not that surprising in general that that's how it's unfolded. But people are clearly laying down paths that... Don't make the most sense. Um, on the other side of things, Arsenal, uh, they obviously get this. This is a big win for them uh, early in the season to, you know, one of their few marquee matches they've had so far this season. Mm-hmm. That actually get the win in this one as they've uh, kind of already what they I think they lost lost to City, lost to Leicester, lost to or, or did they draw? Did they? I think they drew with uh liverpool right yeah i mean um, I, I looked i looked into this. Overly well. the arsenal have not won away at a big six team uh since january of 2015 uh ending a sequence of 29 games without a victory like that is just a a, a staggering number for a club that consider themselves to be one of the elite sides in the Premier League. Like they should have won away to one of these big six sides. And I know we're talking about, you know, a, a weakened United side, but it's, this is, this isn't like, this is the first weakened United side that we've seen. Like this is, this isn't some new trend. Uh, um, what, where do you see their temp check though? I mean, that this is a nice win for them. They are in ninth place. Uh, they have kind of been all over the map as far as just good results, bad results. But, you know, top half of the table and only four points off of the the league leaders, Liverpool. I think they're definitely not out of the discussion for Champions League football at a minimum for next year, right? Like, whether it's fair or not, um, I, I, I I think that's something that they can do. Yeah, no, I, I I would tend to um to agree with that. I I still think 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I still think it's just going to be such a, a dogfight to get into those top four that's I think it could end up being harder than most years because I, I think you're just going to – and I think we saw this last year where there's just so much congestion right there in that like three through seven or three through six. Oh, for sure. And I think like, you know, anyone from Arsenal to Leicester to Wolves – uh, or even United or Arsenal, like these are all teams that could find themselves right in that mix, above that mix, or potentially well, well behind it too. And I, it is, it's great for the Premier League, but from a from a fan standpoint, I think the intrigue uh, wears thin when your team is jostling about in positions that they're not normally used to. Um, going from two uh, big clubs uh, having kind of wonky uh, starts, kind of hinky starts to the season, uh, let's go with a team that had a great start to the season, and it's now um, kind of hit the skids a bit as uh, Everton. After, you know, kind of running out to this early, you know, we're going to take pole position here. Um one point in their last three matches, uh, they find themselves kind of cratering a little bit. They are slipping. I believe they're in fourth right now. Um, and you, a, a lot of it has to do with the fact they got some injuries. Hamas is out. Uh, Godfrey is out. Those are two of their bigger signings of the summer. I think with, you know, we, we try to make the Leicester comparison with them. And Leicester did have have moments where Vardy was dealing with an on-again, off-again injury uh, the year they won, but they got lucky for the most part that they didn't have a bunch of injuries running through their squad, and they didn't have to dip into their depth or lack thereof. Uh, Everton having to do a bit of that, and it, and it it's showing. And in a season where you have injuries on the rise, you obviously have looming threat at any moment that one of your player has to go into COVID protocol. Um, de- depth is important and depth might be the thing that, that might sink Everton. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, they have like 50 center attacking mids. So if any of those guys, yeah, down, <laughs> you know, they, they should be good. But um, I, I digress. I think, there are a lot of scenarios that we could play through here, right? And, um, you know, I, th- I think Everton find themselves in this weird scenario where they 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 came out hot and, and they look like they've made a lot of the right moves. Um, but what we find about, like, these Premier League hot analysis, m- much like the ones that we're seeing uh, and these political analysis that we're, we're all glued to at the moment as we watch the pr- the the presidential election unfold. Um, there are just a lot of factors that you just can't entirely account for that, that make a lot of sense. Like why Everton are good right now. Yeah. they made a lot of good moves, but they were punching well above their weight. Right. Like oh, yeah. for, for a month, two months, Everton were way better than anyone anticipated them to be, despite the fact that they had a good transfer window that they're struggling now seems a little bit more down to earth. And we, I've been cautioning against this for a few weeks now. This isn't a new concept, but they're starting to come back to where we thought they should be. Should they lose this particular match? No, probably not. But it is a sign that there's some chinks in this armor. No, definitely. Um, Interesting enough to bring the two stories together that we've hit so far. 7.30 Saturday, they host Manchester United. One of those struggling clubs might actually get a good result. Maybe being the key word there, right? I mean, it's who is it? A, who is it? Who's it more in need of a win? It's United in this in this case, right? If United goes, uh, you know, goes and plays Everton and loses this match we'll say hey everton is uh you know right in the ship meanwhile we're talking about a manchester united side that is just 
really kind of falling apart and oh, having a yeah. bad week. Yeah, I mean, they're just unraveling at all the seams, and it's not just Pogba who who's getting a majority of the attention. It's everywhere, right? Like, the, the goals have dried up. Marcus Rashford is too busy feeding everyone instead of scoring, and as, as gracious as that movement is, he can't he can't get so involved in that, but he uh, remains a player that's ineffective, right? Um, it's just... Um, United can't get out of their own way, right? It's it's whether it's Solskjaer, whether it's uh, you know another um, another thing. It's just that they they are caught in this negative feedback loop that they can't just seem to get themselves out of at any point, uh, and the things they're involved with. Um, yeah. So we will we will see how that uh, that unfolds as those two uh, two clubs collide. This coming weekend, let's look back, though, at the rest of the weekend, kind of running through some matches. Manchester City getting the 1-0 road W against Sheffield United. Sheffield United, uh, uh, but not as bad as uh, Burnley, who dropped uh, a 3-0 smacking from Chelsea. Yeah, uh, They find themselves at the bottom the table at the moment uh we we listen we've seen them do this houdini act though a couple times though over the last couple seasons where they have these big skids often early on where they just look like they are destined for a, a disastrous relegation season and then it doesn't happen well uh it, it could it could very well happen. I, I do sort of wonder. I, I wonder this during our preview show at the beginning of the year, whether Sheffield United had been found out in their unique strategies everyone was ready for. Uh, I think we, as young as the season still is, and as, as absurd as we're talking about, like, are they going to go down uh, at this point in the year? I, I think that has kind of been proven entirely true. Like, they have yet to find themselves... to to be competitive this year. And now the other teams have figured out little ways to exploit that. Maybe, maybe that's part of the equation, but uh, you know, you, you mentioned Burnley being bottom of the table. Uh, that's in large part because Fulham found a way to get themselves their first win of the season this weekend as well. Uh, yes, they did in the battle of, of the, uh, of futility. It was Fulham getting a win over West Brom. Uh, West Brom, I believe there's uh, West Brom still searching for their first win though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think two sides actually. looking for that first one. Yeah. Uh, I think they're the only other side, which is wild. We're this far into the season that we saw multiple teams that have that issue. Uh, but full, full get a good one. Uh, uh, Scotty Parker's team uh, getting off the mat. Finally, uh, Leicester City, a uh, bit of a statement win against Leeds United. Leeds United, obviously a, a promoted side, a, a darling side that I think a lot of people had as their dark horse, the team that's going to outperform expectations. Um, although I now, I now think expectations actually are are actually really just across the board super high for Leeds United. Um, and I think that's I think a lot of that's based uh, like in you know, reality. I think they are going to be a good side. I think Bielsa is going to put out a, a, a good product for the, for the year. And I, I don't see them as being someone that's even going to really be troubled too much by relegation. Mm -hmm. But uh, Leicester City side goes, goes to Leeds and absolutely smacks them. It's tough. It's tough watching kind of one of those narratives unfold where we've gotten used to the idea of Bielsa being like this master and he's, He's navigated the waters of the Premier League so well uh, so far with Leeds, uh, but but Leicester, being the side that they are, have kind of regained that early season form that Brendan Rodgers' sides have become known for uh, in the Premier League era. And um, you just I, as much as we're talking about Leeds in this situation, I wonder more about how much more of this can we actually you know see squeeze out of a Leicester City side that have not done that very well in the past i saw an article today i didn't even click on it because it was very clickbaity um basically saying should manchester united consider brendan rogers sure I'm so, here like, for that i mean what why not oh i mean it, I, as as someone that loves chaos 
and loves uh, laughing at United when chaos ensues for them. Um, oh my goodness! I mean, what a match made in heaven! Uh, the Barrage getting getting the United gig. Yeah. Boy, head wouldn't fit through the door. It'd be so big by that, that time. Barely not. Um, uh, other teams uh, playing well. Um, Southampton uh, getting a, a, another good result as they hang on to win against Aston Villa, a team that's uh, not trending in the right direction at the moment. Um, they actually, uh, Southampton gave up like two goals, I think, in like uh, uh, the, at the death, pretty much. Uh, but yeah. still hang on to win uh, four to three. So they're, I mean, they're looking fresh. They're looking lively. Um, Danny Ings died in the match, so that's unfortunate. But other than that, mm-hmm. they're looking good. Yeah. Um, y- y- your boys got a W. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily the prettiest one, but that's uh, Jose football for you in a nutshell. Um, I, I bird on bird crime is often not pretty. So. No, uh, for sure. Uh, and most of that bird on bird crime involved Harry Kane and son, apparently just going for dives. Um, yeah. And, and the Kane issue that won the penalty definitely could be a questionable call. Um you know, whether some of the other ones that, that did or didn't get go their way or, or the same for their opponents is certainly open to debate. But um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm cautiously optimistic about the direction this team's heading at the moment. Um, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. You guys got Europa tomorrow. Are you excited for that? <laughs> um, is, it behind, is it behind the paywall? I, I just... Man, I, it's not my wanker this week because I, ju- I just did it, I think, last time out. But I'm just I'm really over and annoyed with paywalls for watching content that I'm already used to getting for not paid. Yeah. Remember the good old days where just having, you know, a cable subscription with FS1 and FS2 to and NBC Sports pretty much gave you every Spurs match you wanted. Uh, it was incredible. I remember like the backs on my hand. One of the greatest days of my life. Um, I, I, I'm trying to find... You guys play... Ooh. Uh, Ludigrets? That'll be fun. Yeah. So it, set your clock for... 1 p.m. on the East Coast uh, to watch that thrilling match. Um, let's go stateside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and really, we're, you know, we're going to kind of hold off on MLS. There, it's, it's the end of the season. It's winding down. So the next time we pod, we'll actually have a full playoff picture to really kind of dive into and dissect and make predictions. So we'll wait. We'll wait till that is settled to do that. Yeah, um, uh, just a quick news flash: FC Cincinnati will not be in the playoffs. Proceed. Wait, hold, hold up. Are you sure? Is that have they been mathematically eliminated? Is that what you're telling me? Um, I don't know that the math is fully there yet, but let's just let's just call it close enough. Uh, I was gonna. I, I thought you were gonna say they they were mathematically eliminated in Orlando. Um, <laughs> Already, actually, actually, really, the the one bright spot of the season, uh, that that tournament for them. Yeah, pretty much. That was the peak. Like now, now looking back, you're like, that was, that was as good as it got. Was, was the MLS is back, uh, tournament run that FC Cincinnati kind of made. I can't imagine the players would feel the same way. I mean, what what's the other thing? Uh, what what's the other option there? All those nil nil draws at Nippert. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. Why not? Um, yeah. The thing we do want to talk about though is uh, the U.S. Men's National Team uh, camp for November has been released. This is a camp that's going to be taking place in Europe, and therefore, obviously, because of the travel restrictions that uh is everywhere uh it's just going to be european players which 
is actually an achievable thing. That's first of all, that's just the first thing. Like there's enough dudes in, in Europe, you know, that are abroad that can come to a camp. Uh, and th- dude, this roster is so exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I saw someone describe it as a uh, like a message board fantasy team. <laughs> <laughs> of like all of these youth players that we've been watching for years and and years to finally coalesce into like a national team call up. The fact that it's been the first national team call up that we've seen since what January of last year, essentially, uh, it makes yeah. it a, a little bit sweeter and and makes it a little bit more like fantasy driven that I think a lot of people are probably prefer, prepared for. Um, yeah, and, and that January camp was your typical January camp where it was pretty much all MLS guys. Right. So right. The the guys that we are seeing on this roster, it from for most of them, it's been a long time since we've seen them in, in the fold. Yeah. And for um, a lot of them, we've never seen them in the fold. Yeah, I mean, just looking through some of the names on this list for guys that we've literally never seen before, <laughs> uh, which is almost surprising. Chris Richards, uh, the the... Bayern Munich center back, uh, who is a former FC Dallas barely slash Alabama youth product. Um, he's getting his first call up. Um, you're, you're also seeing guys like, uh, sub, you know, Sebastian Soto getting his first full call up to the men's national team, despite the fact that we've heard his name, uh, talked about so much, uh, in, in the youth ranks. Um, Conrad De La Fuente, who's kind of been like this, background uh, youth national team product that no one really thinks a whole lot about uh, in the full men's setup. Uh, he's now with the Barcelona first team, and that gets him into the the squad as well. Um, Owen Oda- Odesoe, uh, who's at Wolves. Uh, Yunus M- Musa uh, at Valencia, who's a, a big standout. Richard Ledesma, uh, another one. And, uh, and the Musa one is a is a guy that, you know, this is kind of one of Berhalter's first uh, – potential big pips that this is a kid that ca- captain uh, a youth team for uh, the England under 18s yeah. and is, uh, is, yeah. is getting pushed into the fold here for the U.S. Yeah, I mean, these are just a lot of guys that everyone kind of hoped uh, we, we could get into the fold. They're now being brought into the fold and they're all going to get an opportunity to do it together. Um, I don't think this is necessarily like Here's my here's my biggest fear is that Burhalter rolls out this squad right of all these guys we've wanted to see and that they don't do well in these these few games that we get to test things out for and I can understand why people might find that concerning but I just don't want everyone to light the world on fire if like a bunch of these guys like looking through just uh, most of this list. Barely any guys on this roster at all have anything more than like 20 caps. And that's like that. That's damn near your top. T- uh, I think Tim Ream is the most senior player yeah. in the call. With, list, and he has 40 appearances. That's it. Yeah, with, with John Brooks and Kristen Pulisic, a close uh, second and third. And it's just like, like that's not one overly of the most senior member on that roster. Yeah. Um, now I, I, ahead of this week's show, I, I put out a tweet today and I wanted to just get a couple people's opinions back on this roster because it is, it's an interesting one, right? Like we, we've not quite seen many like it to this point. Um, but I, I think a couple of them, um, Ryan Huff, he, he wrote in and he said, finally get to see a real U S men's national team to which I replied back to him like, well, what, what does that mean? Does that mean all the other ones are fake? And he said, well, too many shit MLS players on the roster. The only one I consider putting in this team is Jordan Morris. But as a death piece, uh, they continue to rely on Zardes, Bradley, Altidore, etc. And we all know what happened. And I hear, I hear Ryan's point. But then I look up at that forward line group and like, you know, Josh Sargent and Sebastian Soto – uh, as talented as they are, uh, N- Nicholas G- G- Giogacci, G- Giacchini, I don't even know who the hell he is. He plays for Cayenne in France. Um, I don't even know if he's a, a center forward, 
But if there's yeah, a spot I was gonna say, on this, if we're going on center forwards, it's just what Sergeant and Soto are the only ones, right? Right. The nine and th- when I when I see that thinness there, I go, well, okay, it makes sense that you're calling up a Josie Altidore still. And that's that's what I I worry about with this roster is like everyone's so hyped that they're not going to see any of the deficiencies that exist within this at least this group as it stands. Yeah, I I definitely I do worry that a little bit, but that but then like you're always we're always going to have that crowd that is just unimpressed, butthurt, and thinks that they have the U.S. men's national team situation figured out better than the federation. Like that, that group always exists and they always have a problem. They always have an issue to gripe about. So like a lot of those people you can just easily ignore anyways. But I do think that not to say that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to freak out if they don't play well, but I do think that there is a lot of people with possibly inflated expectations about a group of young exciting dynamic players all playing for European clubs, some for very big European clubs um, coming together on the field for what will a lot of them be like their first time playing with that group. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's expectations are sky high for a group that never even played together. Like, (laughs) and, and some of them have played together at youth ranks, right? Like this, this isn't an entirely new situation, but uh, it's concerning. I mean, it, it, it's it's not exactly as cut and dry as people like to make it out to sound. And, you know, we, we were talking about the striker position. Mike, Mike Ackley wrote in and he said, you know, I really like the squad, but I'm worried about the striker position. Sergeant and Wea just don't scream clutch striker to me. And, and Jordan Morris might be another example uh, that, that they could pull into those ranks. So, um, I, I you know, Jordan Morris's squad uh, is certainly not going to let him go uh where they are in their season um and understandably so right now but um you know i just i I worry about people getting too hyped about this group as exciting as they actually are yeah yeah no i i agree and you know i do think that while there is a lot of excitement about a lot of the names we're seeing and a lot of promise and potential a lot of things we're seeing I think we've just pointed out, though, one of the the, the realities, though, is like we still don't have an answer to every position right now. Oh, no. Like we we had an answer or at least, you know, option, like really good options at a lot of positions and a lot of good pieces. But there are positions. I think, you know, that center striker is probably the most glaring. Um. Where there's not exactly a proven solution yet. Now, could a guy like Soto come in and totally take that over? I'd like to hope so. Could a guy like Josh Sargent, who now has you know uh, uh, a lot of Bundesliga under his belt, could he come in and and command that a little better? I hope so. But like at the end of the day, like yeah, like. There's still definitely going to be room for like you know, Zardes and 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 uh, Altador and Jordan Morris is definitely going to be in the fold, uh, you know, for when actual qualification and full camps actually resume. Yeah, uh, like it or not, for the general populace, we still need those type of players. What um I I do. What's the situation with uh and I, maybe I'm just completely missing. Is Yedlin hurt or something? Uh, he's been nursing a couple issues, okay. um, but also that was like just, one name since it was a European all European thing. That was like one of the one names. I'm like, I'm surprised they didn't bring him in. I mean, again, it's not like they were lacking with options though. But still, you, yeah, you think that he's I think probably this still is, in the fold, right? Yeah, I mean, I think he would. But then if you look at look at the equation, like where does he normally play, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. And then you look at Serginho Dest and go, well, Barcelona, Newcastle, one guy is getting routine minutes at Barcelona. The other guy is getting somewhat routine minutes at Newcastle. And you go, well, I'd probably choose that guy 
Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a little bit of the symptom of the equation. You also look at someone like Anthony Robinson, who is is very deserving uh, in a look from the outside back position. Uh, Reggie Cannon is probably in that discussion as well, too. So um, I, it might just be an equation of, you know, hey, given that uh, Yedlin's not getting routine minutes at the, at the squad that he would prefer to be in, uh, and he's been battling some injury issues, maybe this is some time to give some other guys a chance to shine. Okay. I think it's going to probably be Brooks and Miyazka most likely. I wouldn't. I wouldn't roll out Tim. Or do you think? Who do you, who do you, or do you think that that uh, Richards gets in there? I I honestly could see Richards or Tim Ream. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Ream with his experience, uh, he he's really done well to guide Fulham back up into the top flight. While uh, they've not done the best job of keeping goals out of the equation, um, he he's definitely the most experienced player. Uh, on the roster uh, and has probably played in some of the most important matches as far as players on the roster as well. So I, I can't imagine Tim's not going to be one of the starters who he pairs with. That's the real question. Who gets the captain's armband? Ooh, great question. I think if Pulisic is healthy enough, uh, I, I could see him getting the armband still. Yeah, I, I think it's either him. I think Stefan also might get it. I think he's captain the side a time or two. Um, I could see I could see Weston get it uh, as well. So who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but it, it is exciting. Um, you know, I we haven't. I don't think we have talked enough about that. Like this group is immensely exciting, right? Like I, I'm looking down this list of of the clubs of the players that have been called in. Uh, Manchester City, uh, you know, Barcelona, Anderlecht, uh, Bayern Munich, um, you know, RB Leipzig, uh, Juventus, Wolverhampton Wanderers, Barcelona again, Chelsea, um, Borussia Dortmund, Werder Bremen, uh, Lille. These, these aren't these aren't just big clubs. They're big clubs where guys are routine appearances um it's just it's a very different time to think of the the think of the squad that didn't qualify for the last world cup how many of those guys were actually even in europe let alone like pivotal pieces of their squads uh now we're talking four years later of you know a, a squad chock full of guys who are contributors at even bigger clubs uh and and deeper uh, across the roster are we seeing those type of players too? I mean, you can even look before that. I mean, remember the the oddity that was a guy like Jurgen Klinsmann that seemed to say a lot of things in the media that was very like downing MLS and I want these guys to go abroad. Um, but they weren't going abroad at the time. So when it came time for him to pick his World Cup squad, it was like almost exclusively MLS dudes. Yeah. Uh, and you have to wonder, too, is it more like uh, him asking players to go abroad that, that drove that? Or is it more because European squads are now seeing this as a more lucrative place to try to recruit talent? Um, you know, both of them could be true, uh, despite the fact that they're kind of conflicting ideas. So um, I, it's just interesting. We're we're. we're we, we hear a lot of people talk about this golden generation of players uh, and we've seen several writers and, and, and people involved in the national team set up going, look, we think we've got more in the pipeline that looks like this. Yeah. Um, and this is hopefully the first wave of players, not a golden generation, but uh, a, a repeat of a, a, a wave of players that are coming one after another. And I think, It'd be interesting if that actually does come to to fruition as we've watched the DA system get torn up and uh, everything kind of get up upheaval in the youth academy development space. Um, will that have all been for naught if it actually uh, it has been producing players over the last few cycles? Um, here's one for you. Like we talked about Jordan Morris. Does he see this crop of players and does he, you know, maybe when he finally gets even called up within that group, does he see this list 
and where things are kind of trending. And does that get him to feel like he needs to go abroad again? He did it once. He got homesick. He kind of bailed pretty early on it. Um, does this kind of almost push some of those guys, those MLS guys on the fringe of the national team into possibly looking to make that move? I I don't know. I mean, Jordan continues to confound us with his, uh, you know, right when you think he's going to do well and in, in going up to a new challenge, uh, he doesn't. And then he comes back into the comfort zone of MLS and he starts blossoming again. And maybe some of these guys just need to be the alpha in the equation, right? Uh, you know, I, I can even speak for myself, you know, uh, having had multiple Division One opportunities, I ended up going to Division Three school because uh, uh, I knew I would get to start right away. Like, that was an easy path for me. And as someone who's conditioned to wanting to play all the time, I didn't want to go to a, a situation where I had to compete for my spot. Players at the pro level feel the same way, potentially, at times, too. So it's just, those are things you have to consider when you're trying to make these type of evaluations. Um... Winners and wankers? I think that's where we're at. Do you want to give me your winner for this week? Uh, my winner, and I, I, I wrote this uh, earlier in the day, and it's already kind of uh, slightly outdated, uh, was uh, Wickham Wanderers last week getting their, over the weekend, excuse me, getting their first, finally their first victory in the championship uh, over Sheffield Wednesday. And I say it's slightly dated because they – they won again today. They got their second win in the championship. Uh, this time a, a road victory, uh, nonetheless. But uh, a team that uh, started out uh, pretty dodgy, uh, pretty rough one. Uh, they uh, they're starting to look alive, and 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 you know they've been in, in literally every match this season that they played. They just couldn't couldn't make it to the finish line uh, on those ninety minutes, and, and kept losing. A lot, a lot of times at the death, um, but they're starting to string together. You know, they had a draw, and they got this win. They got another win. They, they're, they're stringing together points. Who knows? Maybe they won't get relegated. Yeah. Uh, let's all hold our breath, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, LA Galaxy are probably uh, feeling a little bit that way right now. Like, hey, at least at least we can't get relegated. Maybe FC Cincinnati are feeling the same way at the moment, too. Some would say they should. Yeah, uh, probably so. Uh, my winners this week, speaking of teams that uh, have probably should have gotten relegated in the last few years, Colorado Rapids, uh, who are likely going to slip into the MLS playoffs despite the fact that they've played three less matches uh, than most other MLS teams due to COVID quarantines. Still, I just... I mean, they I literally skip- want a bot like a month without a game yeah uh you know they're going to get in on a points per game basis something that mls didn't fully define until mm, about halfway through the return to in market play um but kudos to them uh they had some players that were totally loosey-goosey uh they ended up getting a month off where everyone got to get healthy and get rested and now they're kind of cooking at a better level than they were beforehand and they're likely going to get into the playoffs despite the fact that they've not been taxed and challenged in the same way that every other team in the league pretty much has. So uh, congrats to them. That's totally a winner move on their end uh, to get that type of total benefit. Uh, your, your wanker? Uh, my wanker this week. Uh, I'm going to stay uh, in a realm that basically is someone who is a permanent wanker that never really fully gets to leave the wanker realm. Uh, And that's Ryan Giggs, uh, who um, just just can't seem to get out of his own way. Uh, This is the current Welsh national team manager, former Manchester United standout. Uh, He has been accused of domestic assault uh, and attacking his lover, Kate Greville as she packed her things to leave his Cheshire mansion after accusing him of cheating, uh, which as we all know. Did she finally find out about the, uh, the, the sister-in-law? 
Uh, yeah, uh, apparently either she just found out about something that we've all known for a long time. Or fact, for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, the fact that, uh, you know, Ryan slept with his uh, brother's wife uh, uh, as he's apparently going. This is the best part of it. this is why I find this is just the icing on the cake. He's going to stand down as Wales manager uh, as a result of the arrest uh, for the next three matches, not permanently. Just for the next three matches. So, chalk another advantage towards the U.S. in that, that match. Sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Who's taking over for him? Gareth Bale, player manager. That's what I'm hoping for. Okay. No, that's good. Yeah. I, I was going to say either him or I just, just like uh, the actor uh, uh, from... Uh, uh, from the Americans, what's his name? He's he's Welsh. Just have him do it. Matthew Rhines. Sure. Just have all the there. celebrities from Wales come and just kind of man the touchline. Christian Bale, uh, Matthew Rhines. I think that's all of them. Uh, I don't think there's <laughs> any other. Oh no, I'm sorry. What's the what's the one? Uh, what's the guy? The lounge singer from Vegas. Got me. That guy's Welsh. Sure he is. We'll go with him. What, what's his name? <laughs> yeah, I, I literally have no clue. Should I be looking this up? We're, we're so close to the end of the show, and I've just derailed us with a, a who is that guy. I know, right? Great. I'm going to have to literally remember 56th minute. Wayne Newton. Is that who I'm thinking of? No, Tom Jones. Tom Jones is who I'm thinking of. <laughs> the Wayne Newton. Tom Jones. Famous Welsh people. Famous Welsh people. Yeah, there you uh, go. We'll just get them all out there, just man in the touchline. All right. Uh, what about your wanker this week? Are they Welsh as well? Uh, I don't. I don't know their nationality. There was a handful of people on Twitter that saw the U.S. men's national team roster announcement as a, as they were putting it, a clear indictment on MLS's inability to develop anybody. Ah, oh, great. And let that sink in especially based off of who is on that squad and the number of dudes that started in what's that called MLS. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a, I mean, when they're young, it's a truly <laughs> staggering number of players that came, that came through at least a portion of their career through MLS. It's just, um, those guys will bang whatever drum they need to. And then, I mean, and then they were making the argument like, well, yeah, I mean, that's where they started, but they didn't get developed till they went to their, you know, till they went to this club or that club. And I was like, that, I mean, aren't they always still getting developed in some <laughs> way or form? Like, aren't they still evolving as a player at, at all points in their career? You'd think, but probably but, not. No, but no, no credit could be given to MLS. No acknowledgement uh, of the fact that this was a, uh, a, a, a a November camp that was only going to include, due to travel restrictions, only going to include uh, European-based players. So no acknowledgement that there was even a caveat of why it was all European players. And then also a, a, a refusal to acknowledge that, like, oh, yeah, like a handful of these guys actually, like, like a good amount of them started their career in MLS, and 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 if not their pro career, their youth development happened in MLS or within the United States. Well, we all know this is uh, the day and age of fake news, and uh, everything you just said was a lie. So uh, they are all yeah. trash. U.S. soccer is bad at development, and uh, they should have been chasing more dual nationals. According to some people on Twitter, despite the fact that, you know, we've literally been recruiting them into our national team since the beginning of time. But alas. Yeah. Hashtag 2020. Um, all right. I think that does it for us. It does do it for us this week. Thanks to everyone who participated in this week's show. If you want 
to get involved, have your answers or your input shared in on the show, please do get involved with us. Jeremy's at Jeremy Lance on Twitter. I'm at Wrong Side of Pond. There are contact links on the website at wrongsideofpond.com. Until we talk to you guys next time, have fun. Bye.